Well, thank you very much for that uh, gracious welcome. I appreciate that very much. It's uh, very late here. In fact, it's uh, coming up on one o'clock in the morning. Uh, this will be the first time I've done this in a long time. But um, uh, hopefully this is of, of benefit to you and for your, uh, for your esteemed group. And I hope that, uh, hope that you gain a little insight into how things are progressing in this wonderful world that we, uh, we practice in. So friction ridge analysis, a return to science. Well, why did I call it that? Well, fingerprint, fingerprints are an applied science. Um, and because they're an applied science, they have, they have significant weight in a courtroom. They have, they're regarded as scientific evidence. And it's important that as practitioners, that we practice the science, that we actually conduct ourselves in a scientific manner. When I first started in this business, um, a police sergeant came up to me and put his arms around me and he said, uh, son, he goes, uh, fingerprint science has been around for 80 years and it's not about to change anytime soon. Well, in truth, the fingerprint science has done nothing but change. We've seen change after change after change. The only thing that hasn't really changed is law enforcement and how the practices within law enforcement are undertaken. And we haven't seen that much change in the judiciary either. But the science has changed dramatically in 30 years. Most fingerprint examiners practice what we call ACE-V. There's a couple of derivatives of ACE-V that are practiced. There's a linear version. There's an interdependent linear version. Ultimately, we say that we do a qualitative quantitative analysis of friction ridge impressions. And we use ACE-V as a method to be able to assess these, these features and, and these impressions. Currently, we doc, how do we document uh, ACE-V? Currently, the practice is that when a person uh, Gets a gets a fingerprint from a crime scene, and they're gonna they're gonna do an analysis on it. They'll perform some sort of rudimentary bench notes called analysis bench notes. Uh, these bench notes are very very uh, rudimentary. Um, you look at them, and there's a lot of check boxes. Uh, you know, substrate was glass, metal, painted, uh, impression particulars. It, it really doesn't tell you any information of any tremendous value. And sometimes there's a, you know, you can talk about the anatomical factors, and this is all supposed to be done before you've actually even seen a comparator. All right. You might have an, an option here to sketch or in, insert a photograph of something, and but there's not a lot of room to articulate what you what you actually analyzed, and there certainly isn't any mention of qualitative quantitative analysis in here. All right, and this leads to your typical friction ridge analysis report. Analysis, atomical factor, anatomical factors, substrate matrix, development medium, deposition pressure, pressure distortion, describe the clarity, what kind of tolerance are there? And then there's usually a statement of belief. Uh, the latent is sufficient without any information of how you determined that or what you base that on. We just kind of have to take the examiner's word for it that the that the latent print is sufficient. And then we get to the comparison phase and there might be something in there that says essentially the, the process in which the comparison was undertaken, but we don't know anything specific to the actual latent print that was analyzed. This is very typical. And then the evaluation, there's usually uh, grossly overstated unscientific determinations such as, um, individualize, uh, essentially meaning that it came from one source that only that source that has ever lived, will live or is living. Um, it's, a, it's a statement of certainty. And in science, there's nothing certain, all right? And of course, again, it's back to the issue of belief. 
belief that uh, that there is agreement and that there's sufficient information in there to be able to do this. And then the verifier, the person who performs the verification, as minimal as these notes are, they do even less. So this is the established practice. This is taking place around the world. And there just has to be a better way of doing this. All right. Back in 2012, SWIGFAST was the body at the time that was offering guidance to latent print examiners. Um, came out with a document number eight, essentially the standards for documentation of ACE-V. And the very first thing they say, the very, very first thing they say is that when friction bridge details examined using the ACE-V methodology, examiner's documentation shall be such that another qualified examiner can determine what was done and interpret the data. So in other words, they should be able to receive your report, look at your report. So oh, these are the features that uh, they used, blah, 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 and go through the entire ACV process through the report and then make the determination as to whether or not it meets or exceeds expectations. Current documentation has a number of shortcomings, right? A lot of the information that's in these reports is guesswork or it may be irrelevant. For example, um, they wanna talk about what the matrix of the fingerprint is when they never test for it. I mean, nobody tests the matrix of a fingerprint. Why even put it in the report? Why would you put something in the report that you can't testify to? Anatomical factors, uh, eight times out of 10, it's a guess. You know, pressure distortion, if you understand it, um, by all means, put it in there. Claims of sufficiency, what are they based on, right? Again, unsupported statements of belief. These are problems. And then we get down to the real nuts and bolts of, of fingerprint analysis, a quality assessment. You know, a description of clarity is present in these reports, but there's no information on how that clarity affects the ACE process. There's nothing in there that describes the variability of the clarity. There's nothing in there that talks about uh, the value of the clarity of the quality in a latent print. Quantity assessments, right? Is, is there anything to do deal with quantity? How did you determine the value for the level one detail? You know, did you understand the value associated to level one detail? How did they determine the value for the level two detail features that they offered that they observed? You know, there's very little information in these reports about um, level two detail feature selection. So we don't know if the examiner was looking at level two detail or level three detail. You know, what were they counting? Uh, how did they value level three detail that they might have observed in this report? Okay. And of course, the big one, how did they determine the latent to be sufficient? And of course, sufficiency is re relative to the purpose of that sufficiency. So for example, um, the sufficiency for a comparison and perhaps for identification might be one threshold, but the sufficiency for exclusion might be a lower threshold. The sufficiency for searching through an APHIS database may be a different threshold. Sufficiency for being able to save that record to an APHIS database is an, another uh, sufficiency threshold. Then we get to the comparison part of the uh, report, of the friction bridge analysis report. And we just seldom see anything meaningful in these reports that detail the comparison. You know, what was this uninterrupted sequence of, uh, that they used to determine that there was agreement between the latent print and the known print? Was there any dissimilarity? I've been a private uh, defense consultant for four years. I have never seen a statement where the similarities that were obviously present in the, in the actual latent print were addressed. This is problematic. They have to be addressed. We talked about ACE processes. Well, there's a couple of different versions of ACE processes. You know, there's one 
the linear process where you start with your analysis, you compartmentalize it. You've done your analysis. Now you get to your comparison. Now you get to your evaluation. And But there's another uh, version of ACE-V uh, that's uh, proposed by uh, John Vanderkalk, uh, very, very well-respected latent print examiner, that talks about double ACE-V, right? Analysis of the latent, analysis of the temperant, comparison, evaluation. And he suggests that you can go back and forth between these different phases until you're happy and get to the finish. Well, when you go backwards in an analysis, it's known as a recursive practice. And it has consequences because you're, you're looking at a clear known print record and, in, and then looking at the latent print record, which is usually terrible, and you're inferring features from that nice clear thing that should be where they're supposed to be in the, in the poor, poor latent print. So, you know, in the comparison thing, did, did we need to know, did the examiner scrutinize the known record before they examined the latent print? Because there's bias involved there. We don't often see documentation that addresses why the quantitative value of the analysis, when you're in the analysis phase, you have a quantitative value. Uh, and then when you get to the comparison, you have a different value because not all the features are present in both images, right? But we never seem to get that information in these reports. And of course, um, in recent times, um, we've determined that if APHIS was used, an automated fingerprint identification system was used uh, to determine a comparator, um, you know, did the examiner adjust their sufficiency threshold uh, to address the possibility that the APHIS might have found incidental similarity between two different records? This is what APHIS does. It finds close matches, right? Would those close matches be indistinguishable to a human examiner? Depends on how much information's in the print. So then we get to the evaluation and the current documentation shortcomings. We need to know what data was used to determine that evaluation, you know? And of course, was the evaluation overstated? Did they use words like certain? And you think that it wouldn't happen in this day and age, but I had a case recently where an officer actually used that he was certain that the identification was valid. And individualized is a standard one. Again, it's, it, it means one thing to a latent print examiner, but in a court of law, words have consequences. An individualization means certain source attribution. And we can't, you can't do that in science. You know, was the conclusion stated as a fact instead of an opinion of a, you know, of something? And of course, what was the strength of that evaluation? That's important too. It's one thing to say it's an identification. Well, you know, we know that fingerprint science isn't as black and white as we once thought it was. We know there are thresholds and sometimes you are below the threshold. Sometimes you're sort of near the middle of the threshold and sometimes you're above the threshold. The strength of the evaluation is important for a, a trier of fact to understand. Because the one thing that I think um, latent print examiners around the world sometimes fail to grasp is that they're not the only one reading this report. It has to be read by people uh, who might not have an, uh, an understanding of latent print examination the way a latent print examiner does, but they're gonna need to know the content of this report to make decisions that are relative to the people that are implicated. <coughs> Excuse me. So the friction ridge analysis of return to science is built on three principles. Number one, science is data driven, right? As a, as a scientist, you want data and the more data, the better, right? Opinions that are derived as a result of data, that's actual science in practice, right? You're developing an opinion, but you're basing it on something that you've observed and that you can demonstrate. And without data, you know, your opinion is really an unproven hypothesis. 
If you, if you just want people to believe you, that's one thing. But I think for far too long, we've expected people to just take our words for it because we are the experts. So you should listen to us. We are the experts. You, sh you should just take our word for it. When in actual fact, we should be thinking the opposite. We should be saying, don't take our word for it. We should be saying, here, let me lay out the data. Let me lay out the methodology. Let me lay out the process. Let me be as transparent as I can. And then you make up your mind because that's exactly what's going to happen in a court of law anyway. The more we do that, actually, we end up strengthening our evidence. So the way forward begins with an understanding, a consensus of what constitutes the fundamentals of friction ridge analysis. We need a clear understanding of what data is and what data isn't. All right. And we need a better understanding of how to apply that how to apply value to that data, okay? So here we have the data, level one detail, pattern classification. This was an actual beaut of a print, by the way. If you saw this as a flat impression, you'd swear you were just dealing with a small uh, right slant loop. But as a rolled impression, this is a classic composite uh, pattern. I've never seen anything this big in my life. The most articulate system to describe level one detail come, come to us or came to us from, uh, from the Henry system. Now the Henry system isn't used as a classification system per se anymore. We don't file fingerprints. Although there are still some places around the world that do actually file um, Henry fingerprint classifications, um, but we typically don't. But I still think Henry, the Henry classification system should be taught, at least it's to some extent, because one of the things I find that with, with the Henry system, it's, it's a, a language. It's actually a, a language that helps latent print examiners describe level one detail. And when you can describe level one detail, you can actually use data that was actually derived uh, once upon a time when we were filing by Henry system. And we were able to see the prevalence of various classifications in the various fingers. I had a case recently where a, a person put in their report that uh, the, right slant, uh, the right slant loop from the right hand is unique. Well, I look at the table here and, and there's really nothing unique about a right slant loop uh, in the right hand. Uh, you know, whereas I go down here and look at a composite or an accidental in the left little finger, the chances of that are, are quite remote. And, but the value of understanding the pattern uh, distribution I think I think adds to our ability to apply value to level one detail. Okay. Next data is level two detail, coarse ridge features. And by coarse ridge features, we mean mature ridge features. In other words, they are robust. They usually contain a sweat pore. They'll be consistent with the surrounding ridges in width. Right, they're known by several different names, points, Galton's details, coarse ridge features, minutia, dactyloscopic points. The important thing about these features are of course that they are reliable, in other words, reproducible, very reproducible, and they are persistent, okay? They don't change much. And essentially in friction ridge analysis, level two features do the heavy lifting. They are responsible for most of the uh, the data that we are going to collect about a particular impression or print, okay? Doesn't matter what you call them. What matters is what you, is how you can articulate how these, what these features can and what they can't do, okay? 
But the important thing there is reliable and persistent, uh, highly reproducible. Generally speaking, there's only three uh, coarse ridge features, a ridge ending, a bifurcating ridge, and a ridge dot. And then you have a whole bunch of other uh, names that are essentially combinations of, of those three things. You know, a trifurcations is really like two bifurcations right on top of each other. A spur is, uh, is a bifurcation and a ridge ending. Um, but we need to develop some consistency in examiners so that they understand that what they're measuring are these mature features. Okay. And one of the reasons these things are, are scientifically valid and why, why we can use them, why we place so much weight on them and their ability to actually uh, identify people is because there's been a robust history of statistical analysis associated with the likelihood of two prints, two prints from different sources having the same arrangement of minutia. Um, and while each of these, uh, these studies is some, in some way flawed, the one thing I, I really appreciate about, appreciate about all these things is that they all sort of say the same thing from a heuristic level, they're all saying that the chances that two people are gonna have the same arrangement of say 12 minutia, um, the same constellation in 12 minutia, is just incredibly remote, all right? So it gives credence to the, uh, to the idea that, that we can actually use these features to actually individualize somebody. Some would argue that uh, there's a number of APHIS systems around the world that uh, are used by law enforcement and all kinds of other agencies. And they've never found two prints uh, from different uh, sources that were you know, essentially the same or indistinguishable. But the truth is, I'm, I'm reluctant to use that one because having worked in law enforcement, I was never looking for it. I was never looking for two prints the same from different sources. I was always looking for identifications. I wanted to resolve that crime scene print. And so, you know, if, if you're not looking, you're not going to find it. So, you know, when this gets more into the hands of scientists as opposed to law enforcement, that there might be an argument to be made in that regard. And then we get to level three detail. Level three detail you know, came at us from, uh, you know, poroscopy came from Mr. Locard and edroscopy from Mr. Chatterjee. Uh, ever since we've been talking about level three detail, we've, uh, we've all fawned over how wonderful it is and how discriminating it is and how, uh, how we long to be able to do what we did with uh, level two features, be able to use each of these features and, and just start drilling down on minute areas of friction skin to be able to sort of attribute the source to, to two different impressions. The big problem with level three detail is that typically it's only 60% reproducible. And that came to us from uh, Dr. Cedric Newman. I uh, saw a presentation of his in uh, Connecticut back in, I wanna say 2010. Yeah, and uh, when, when, six, when your level three detail is 60% reproducible, that means that 40% did not reproduce, right? We don't have a lot of studies that have ever even attempted to try and attribute value to these features. We don't have a statistical model that we can fall back on and say, well, okay, you know, Locard said there were 40, if you have 40 pores uh, in agreement, you should be able to individualize somebody. But that was kind of just off the top of his head. And just because he said it doesn't make it necessarily true. You know, the people that use level three detail usually are able to defend it by their knowledge of differential growth and biological uniqueness. And even then, they know they're open to criticism uh, in their use. So the question is, if, if level three detail is only 60% reproducible, or, you know, and there's little of any studies that can support value in level three detail, can these features be used? 
because the uh, the IWGFI two um, very eloquently put it this way. They said, if the absence of information creates no fundamental dissimilarity, the presence provides no basic similarity to assigning dactylostopic points. So if you're not going to worry if it didn't reproduce, you shouldn't be able to say, yay, it did, and I'm going to use it, right? Level three has, is not useless. Level three is quite valuable. And where it shows its value and it really shows its teeth is in a quality assessment. So this is a sufficiency model that's put forward by SWIGFAST, again, the body that uh, offers guidance to latent print examiners. And you'll see that uh, in the quality metric, they have four categories and each of them talk about level three details, right? In the low count, there's no level three details, no distinct level three details, minimal level distinct and medium low, minimal level distinct th level three details and medium high, and abundant level di distinct level three details. You know, you've got a high thing. So as the quality increases in your, in your latent print impression, you require less level two features to be able to do something um, of an identification nature um, with that particular impression. And that's where level three detail shows its true teeth. Okay. So that all said, and we've seen how poor our documentation is, our documentation needs to be focused on achieving the goal in the SWIGFAST document number eight from 2012. When friction ridge detail is examined using the ACEV methodology, examiner's documentation shall be such that another qualified examiner can determine what was done and interpret the data. So how do we do it? How we do this is by properly documenting the analysis, the comparison, and the evaluation. And we'd start with the analysis. We need to annotate the print we need to apply a value to the data that we get from that particular annotation. And we need to make and support a sufficiency determination for this analysis. One of my favorite tools for doing just that is the gyro system developed by Dr. Christophe Champod and Dr. Glenn Langenberg. They came up with a system very easy green, yellow, red, orange, gyro, with the colors representing confidence uh, to features. It can be used in quality annotation. It can be used in a quantity annotation. annotation. In, the in the quality annotation, it shows the variability of quality in a latent print impression. This happens to be an anhydrin print. And you can see there's good areas, there's mediocre areas, and there are poor areas. In the, uh, in the quantity annotation, excuse me, you also see the variation in the level two features, okay? Not all points are equal. And some, you know, some need to be valued less. Some maybe not, but we see the strength of that particular uh, print. We can demonstrate latent sufficiency because we can say, well, now I, could, I have a metric that I can use to determine the quality of this particular latent print. And you go down the list and you find that level one's distinct. Most of the level two features are distinct. There are minimal level three features, boom. Medium high level of quality. When you do your gyro level two detail quantity analysis, You've got four green features, 11 yellow features, one red feature is kind of hard to see. And then you say, well, what's the value of those features? The greens and the yellows are worth one. The red is worth 0.5. And then when you total that, your quantitative value, you have 15.5 minutia. And of course, using the data from these annotations, we apply it to the sufficiency graph, okay? 
you've got a medium high quality, you've got a 15.5 minutia value. This shows that uh, these three sections here, this is essentially um, uh, no value, all right? Uh, an identification is not warranted. The B zone, the yellow zone on the sufficiency graph represents a complex case uh, zone. An identification may be warranted, but extensive documentation is going to be required to support it. And then here in the, in the green, in the C, an identification may be warranted. So the data from this particular qualitative quantitative assessment shows that this print, this latent print is suitable for comparison, suitable for identification purposes. And you can demonstrate that. Then you have to document the comparison. You need to use the, 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 the latent data in the analysis phase and compare that data to the comparator print. You note the features that are in agreement. You note any dissimilarity including the features that did not reproduce, and you demonstrate your sequence of agreement, and you have to show your data, extent of ag agreement and dissimilarity. So here we have our comparator, you know, the, the temperant uh, doesn't look all that good, but well, it's the world we live in. This was the data from the gyro uh, level two analysis we did, and we see all these red dots show features that were in agreement between the latent print and the known print record. And these are the features that didn't reproduce. I've illustrated it. And it's actually very normal to not find all the minutia in both images. It's very normal, but it needs to be stated, right? I also found because the the information in the actual known print is a little clearer. I was able to see a feature that I didn't mark in my analysis and I marked it in orange, all right? And because that was actually found as a result of a recursive process, in other words, from the known clear known print record to the latent print, I'm gonna value it less, okay? And now I'm gonna show my sequence right? The comparison sequence. We all talk about the identity, identity of friction ridge formations uh, or is established by the, uh, or the identity of friction ridge impressions is established by the continuous agreement of friction ridge formations in sequence, having sufficient uniqueness to identify. You have to show your uninterrupted sequence of features. So I started down here. I follow a path. I was able to do the exact same thing in the latent as I was in the uh, in the known print, there's my sequence. That is, those are the features. That's how I was able to establish that these features, these two prints were in agreement, all right? And when I take a look at the data associated to that sequence of agreement, I find that, uh, you know, with quality, we've already determined to be medium high. There were four green features, four yellow features, one red feature, one orange feature. And the orange feature, of course, was the feature that we saw only after the comparison actually began, all right? And we get to the evaluation, which is gonna be a very important part of this whole thing. You base your evaluation data on your comparison data, okay? And you apply that to a sufficiency model. And if you're gonna use extended data, such as open spaces, level three detail, creases, scars, et cetera, you need to be able to include that and be prepared to de defend how you valued it, okay? Say if you saw uh, seven ridges and there was nothing going on, like an open space, and maybe you count that as one minutia, well, put that in your report. Then you're transparent, okay? And it's very important at this stage of the game to use appropriate wording and taking steps not to overstate your conclusion because we're in a world of science, certainty doesn't apply. We have to move away from state, absolute statements and statements of fact because we can be wrong, right? So we apply the comparison data to our sufficiency model, right? We talked about the four, four, one, one, orange. I valued the uh, data, green, yellow, one, red, 0.5. And that orange feature, I gave it a value of 0.75 because it's 
I can't give it the same value of a good feature in uh, as if I had seen it in the analysis phase. I have to give it slightly lower value because I didn't see it until the comparison phase. So it's just fair reasoning. And we came up with a, a qualitative assessment for the comparison of 9.25 minutia. And we placed that on the sufficiency graph. And you'll see that here we are, medium high, 9.25. We are right on the border of a complex case or where a, an identification may be warranted to the C, which is an identification is warranted. And because we've done extensive documentation, we're good. If you hadn't done extensive documentation and you were flirting around here, how would you defend that, you know, such a, a marginal print, you came to your conclusion and you supported, you, you believed it was, it was a, a source of attribution. It's, it's important to show how we actually work, okay? So then we talk about wordings. Right now, under the new OSAC uh, guidance, guidance that we're receiving, there are actually five conclusions that you can come to as a latent print examiner. Most countries around the world are still stuck at three. Um, source identification, inconclusive, and exclusion. But uh, OSAC also includes support for same source and support for different sources. The interesting thing that I, I think is a really positive step in the right direction is that on the source identification, so the one end of the scale, it says here source identifications reach when the friction ridge impressions has corresponding ridge detail and the examiner would not expect to see the same arrangement of details repeated in an impression that came from a different source. So it's giving you some wiggle room. It's saying, yeah, you, you believe that it's, you know, that, that it's got strong support. It's got really strong support that this is the source the source of this particular impression is this particular finger of this particular person, but you're leaving yourself a little wiggle room just in case you're wrong, All right? And the same thing goes on the other end of the scale. Source exclusion, which used to mean it isn't him, it could never be him, it's or negative in, in, in law enforcement terms, it says here, is the two is a conclusion the two friction ridge impressions did not originate from the same source source exclusion is reached when the examiner's opinion considering the observed data the probability that the two impressions came from the same source is considered negligible so they're still leaving you wiggle room to be wrong right and again that is science that is what we do so the existing report system isn't working. Making a report system that shows this type of data and this type of, of, uh, of uh, information that can be understood by everybody who's going, not only gonna be reading that report, it's not just the latent print examiner, it's not just the verifier, it's also the supervisor, it's gonna be lawyers, it's gonna be judges, Anybody who reads that report will understand what was done and how they figured things out. And that only strengthens our evidence. Okay. This process addresses the requirement of friction ridge science as it exists today. But science is always moving, so we always kind of we can't be caught flat footed. We kind of have to keep adapting and adjusting and learning and uh, reapplying as we develop new information. Who knows, one day maybe we will be able to use level three uh, detail in the same or in a similar fashion to perhaps how we use level two. It's not there yet, but uh, the science always progresses. I say that we can't use it now. That doesn't mean to say, well, I, can, I don't say that we can't use it now. We do use it. We use it in quality assessments but we need to be able to adapt to the scientific changes that are constantly, on, they're constantly happening. Um, and one of the benefits of this, this process, we hear a lot of criticism about the effects of bias. 
this type of process will go a long way to addressing a lot of those biases. Doesn't address them all, but it does address a lot of them. And that is a good thing for the business. And of course, one of the things that I've, I've known from my own personal experience, when we implemented a disclosure process back in, back in the day in law enforcement, um, we insisted that they do certain things and they fought tooth and nail. They didn't want to do it. And then when they started doing it six months later, you couldn't take it away from them because they loved it because it improved their skills and because they developed better, they developed better analysis skills and they became better expert witnesses. This is the type of thing that will help develop that kind of talent. And in the court system, it's going to improve the trustworthiness of uh, friction ridge evidence. And that is worth a lot in this day and age. You know, remember, um, people shouldn't take our word for it just because we're expert witnesses and because we're experts. We should say, don't take my word for it. Here's the data. And to that end, I am uh, happy to report that uh, a course is underway being developed. Uh, a three-day course is being developed that's going to show people exactly how to do this. And um, I'm looking forward to be able to give that course hopefully by September of this year. And if you need anything from me, by all means, reach out to me. My email address is there. Uh, the website, you can reach me through that. And uh, I hope you folks uh, got something out of this presentation. It was a lot of fun for me to present it. Thank, Thank you. you.